Hello and welcome to tonight's webinar, the macroeconomic outlook for spring 2023. Will President Biden have the luck of the Irish? Featuring Farouk Langdana, Program Directors of Rutgers Executive MBA and Rutgers Business School Professor of Finance and Economics. My name is Sharon Leiden. I'm the Associate Dean of Alumni and Corporate Engagement at Rutgers Business School. And I'm pleased to serve as your host and moderator for tonight's very special webinar. I'm joined by my colleague, Nancy Kiley. Nancy, if you wanna just wave, who will monitor the chat for questions throughout the event. We have allotted an hour and a half for today's program and are eager to begin. But before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar will be recorded and a link to the archive version will be shared via social media and sent to all attendees in a few days. And we hope you will send your questions to us as they come to mind throughout the presentation using the chat in Zoom. We'll get to as many questions as possible. And Farouk does an amazing job. Um, all your questions and comments will be addressed uh, if they're not during the webinar and he'll respond to you later and we'll send that information to all participants. So I don't know how he does it all, he's amazing. So now let's get started. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our Dean at Rutgers Business School, Dean Lay, who will now say a few words. Dean Lay. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. So I'm very happy to see you all. And thank you for joining us at this uh, important event, a special lecture by Professor Farouk Landana. Many of you already know Farouk because you took his class before. But for those who do not, I would like to share with you a little background information about this award-winning professor at Rutgers University and the director of our globally ranked executive MBA program. So Dr. Farrell Klandana is a well-known professor of finance economics. His areas of research and teaching expertise include global monetary and fiscal policy analysis. He has published many articles and five books and has won over 30 teaching awards, including the prestigious Susan uh, Warren Susan Award, which is Rutgers University highest teaching award. So in addition to US, Professor Lambana has also taught extensively globally in China, Singapore, France, Iceland, and India. He is a recent recipient of the Rutgers Business School Dean's Meritorious Service Award. And he was also recently awarded as the RBS Dean's Professor of Business. We are all very proud of him, his work and his excellence in teaching. So now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Professor Farouk Landana. Farouk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Lay, and thank you, Sharon and Nancy and team for organizing this. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, the reason I'm smiling so broadly is I'm seeing faces I haven't seen in a long time. And uh, it's very difficult to stay serious and talk about macro when I see people who I haven't seen in 10, 15 years again, but I will try and focus and on macro, but so good to see you all. So I have students, uh, Dean Lay from the executive MBA, from part-time, from the full-time program, and Ember from Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore. I have somebody who taught the first branding module in Ember, Steve's there. Then I've there's Carol, who was the first, second, first, second guest speaker in Ember. Then Jim Klein, who brought English muffins to Cambridge University. I mean, I can go on, you know, from each photograph. So, and then we have students from last night's class who have just done two classes with me. So this is going to be a little ahead of you. <laughs> we still have 12 more classes left. So they are in here too, Adin Lei, and Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore too. So 
and again, and um, Dean Le, when you invited me to speak to your board, uh, this is going to be the same message. So I am consistent. So please let your board know that Langdana's okay. forecast in December does not change in January. Okay. <laughs> I am consistent. And um, the, the bottom line is still the same. And some housekeeping comments here. Um, um, generally, keep your microphones muted, please. But if you have a question, just unmute and ask away. Don't worry about jumping in. There's a three second lag and we all know all about the Zoom lag. So just jump in and Mihir, I know you're not gonna have any problems. I can see you getting ready to ask a question even before I've started. Um, and I already have questions from Jesse Cohen. So jump in anytime. Also put your questions in the chats and Nancy is going to capture the chats um the questions in there because we've had over a hundred questions in the chats and i will respond by email afterwards okay so i'll try and at this time i'll actually make an attempt to save the last 10 minutes um for q a i'll try and then the rest of the questions in the chats i'll email the answers to you so everyone will get answered um one way or another I have a surprise ending for you. It's a little whimsical. And um, <laughs> some of you have seen this one before at a um, reunion. And if you know me, whimsical shouldn't be a surprise because that's kind of what I am. And so here's the roadmap today. I'm going to, we're going to get into it. It's going to be intense. Um, I'm going to do a little backtracking since some of you have been to all my sessions. And some of you I haven't seen in years and years. So I'm just going to back up a bit and let you know where we've been, what's happening now. And then we're going to look ahead and see what it looks like for Biden's future and if the luck of the Irish will still hold. And um, so that's the roadmap. And I'm not sure how much macro you remember. And of course, last night students haven't seen this. so. I'll do little reviews wherever I can, okay? And um, yeah, I got a bunch of topics. I'm gonna to string all this together. Let me quickly see if I have to respond in the chat to anything. Um, somebody is driving and listening to this, oh my God. <laughs> well, when I have diagrams, do not look at them, please. Let's get this I'm not Professor. Oh, hey, Sashi, how are you? Good. I'm doing good, thank you. Professor. Good, good. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well, thank you for being here. All right, so here is the backdrop and let's do this. It's 1982, Jimmy Carter finally gets it right. God bless the poor man. And he hires Paul Volcker and Reagan later takes credit for Paul Volcker, which he, the Reaganites shouldn't have done, but they still do. So. Carter hires Paul Volcker, Chicago economist, six foot four, I think, cigar blowing, grumpy, growly. I actually met him with Giles Mellon, and some of you know Giles Mellon, the executive MBA director who kind of gave me my job. And so we met Paul Volcker, growly, grumpy Fed chairman in Manhattan. He knew Giles. And we told Giles, we told Paul, Paul, we have a new model. We are proving that when confidence is really low, nothing helps. And Paul looked at us and said, any idiot can figure that out. And I went, oh my gosh, we just got slammed by Paul Volcker. Oh my gosh. So he was that kind of guy. And I'm going to cut my stories down because I need to be serious today and stay on track. So Paul Volcker stamps on the money supply, crushes monetary growth, kills inflation. 1982, hard landing, and we're gonna re review all that. Boom, inflation gone. So inflation goes from being a double digit entity in America to not a problem. So we have lived without inflation from 82, 83 onwards till 2022 February. So if you are somebody who's kinda young, under 35, you haven't really seen inflation. You know, you don't really know. This is a whole new thing for you. And so inflation was gone. We saw SAP bubbles and that's speculative asset price bubbles. So we saw inflation 
exploding in little sectors like housing, boom, and SPACs and dot coms earlier on and crypto and so on and so forth, but not across the board. And so inflation is an across the board increase in the price level. We just saw little, you know, we saw one room in the house going red with inflation, the rest of the house nice and calm, so bubbles. That went in 2022 and inflation came back and everyone thought the sky was gonna fall on the head and oh my gosh, inflation, oh, it's gonna be stagflation. And to my credit guys, I said, calm down. That's what I said, if you remember. And I said, stagflation was 10 years of repeated wrong paradigm mistakes, two oil shocks, 10 years. You know, those of you who are too young don't know. And I mentioned this, there was a time and I wasn't here. I got here in 79, so I missed that whole drama. But apparently in the 70s at a party, if you had a 15% mortgage, you would stop the music. People would say, turn off grand funk. Tell them how much mortgage you got. That was a good rate back then, 15, 16%. So that's how bad inflation was. So now it's back and everyone thought the sky was gonna fall on the head last year. And I said, the, seven, the, the stagflation was 10 years of it. This is not that bad. So inflation was there, it's coming down now. And then for a period so from 2008 till now, budget deficits, we stopped talking about budget deficits. They just were, became a non-problem. Some of you who were in my early classes, remember the, the huge discussions we used to have on budget deficits and sustainability. And in presidential elections, that was the big debate question between the presidential candidates every time. You know, so what's your plan to reduce the budget deficit? And of course, the prepared answer, well, I have been attacked in five different ways. And I got spending cuts. Last election, not a word about budget deficits. Then last election, not a word about really anything in general. That was a bizarre election. So it's probably not a great example. But so deficits, there was no talk about it. They didn't matter. A book came out by Stephanie Kendron. And you had Bernie Saunders and Alessandra Ocasio-Cortez saying deficits don't matter. So I'm gonna take you through that whole drama. Again, I said deficits do matter. I said this is a weird, perfect storm. Nothing is broken, macro still works, and it does. And so I'm gonna take you through all that and to the present in the next hour. Okay, so stay with me. Any questions before we start? taking off? No questions in the chat, Professor. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna share the screen and we are going to Microsoft Whiteboard so I can move there. There we go. Collapse this here. I'm hoping everyone can see the whiteboard now. Okay, so a lightning review, folks. Let's close this. Let's use blue. So lightning review, this is the old Keynesian model. And all this should be coming back to you. And so this is output. And all this is gonna be recorded with output is Y and jobs. Let's put jobs in here too. And these are percentage growth rates. So this is growth rate of output. On this axis, which is Y, if you remember, and right in here was Y max, maximum output and full employment. So that's that point there, full employment. And this is the aggregate supply, the supply of everything in the economy. And I'll talk through this again, and that's a straight line there, by the way. And this is inflation. And again, this inflation thing just came up last year and after really being a non-issue for so long. All right, so let's look at this diagram and you folks can see this cursor moving around. Somebody say something, yes? We can see it. Okay, yeah, thank you. We can see it. Okay, thank you. So this is output and this is jobs on this axis and this is maximum, Y max. So maximum output for America is probably around say 7% growth annually. 
six to seven percent. And full employment usually was four percent, five percent. And we're going to get to that later on. And look at this. It's it goes like this, and then it hits this brick wall here. Maximum output, maximum growth. You're running out of high-skilled workers. Let's use the pointer. You're running out of high-skilled workers. And so it kind of stops there and goes straight up. So that's the brick wall, if you will. You're running out of nickel, lithium. We're going to talk about lithium later today. I'm going to take you into electric batteries today. <laughs> uh, the, and, and what and folks, generally, if we could just mute ourselves, please, that'll be great. Thank you. So it goes here, it hits this brick wall and it goes straight up. Right in here, you're running out of high skilled workers. You're running out of rare elements, precious metals, nickel, cadmium, cobalt, workers especially, and that's an overheated economy right in there. So right in there is a danger. You're in, you know, we will see bubbles forming, running out, overheating. This is an overheated economy, okay? All this should be coming back. And this here, let's go back. This is the aggregate demand, total demand for everything in the economy, aggregate supply is total supply of everything. And here is the initial interest rate P0. Ah, oh, sorry, inflation rate P0, and this is, let's say, Y0. So when our story begins, this is our economy and lightning overview. So Keynes, pronounced Keynes, ah, sorry, K-E-Y-N-E-S, pronounced Keynes in the 1930s from Cambridge University. And there was a time when some of you were with me looking up at his office in Cambridge a long time ago. So Keynes taught us that, look, you can actually move this baby to the right and create jobs. And this was a revelation. Many considered him to be the greatest mind of the last century, because at that time, the sense that we, we could move the curve, that it was the government's role to move the curve was not recognized. And I'm making a long story short, okay? So he, taught us you can move the aggregate demand. And it was a drastic suggestion, radical. And Bill and um, Joe Biden is a high priest Keynesian. And interestingly, the whole planet essentially is in this world now. And generally, the Democrats have been labeled as Keynesians. Republicans are supply-siders. But that's the labeling. The reality is much different for both maybe later on. So Keynes taught us, yeah, you can move this baby to the right. You can do it by increasing good government spending. So in, in his time, it was only infrastructure. Okay, today, this is a hot potato, which I'm not going to hold. Is government spending, infrastructure, defense, power grid, um, transportation, clean water, uh, cybersecurity, or is it unemployment, welfare, transfer payments, Medicare, Medicaid, daycare? So that's a hot potato. So in Keynes time, it was good G infrastructure spending as he called it then. And another way he said was to decrease interest rates. And basically that means the Fed increases money supply. So the Fed prints more money, very, very making this very simple and lowers the interest rate. And there was a third button, decrease in taxes. So those are your three policy buttons, increase in G, decrease in interest rates, and cut taxes. And that's how Keynes said you can jumpstart the economy. And look, look at what happens. You can get Y higher, Y higher, and more jobs here. So. From here to here, more jobs, you're jump starting. And what's the downside of this? You end up getting more inflation. And this is known as the good kind of inflation. So all the talking heads on TV, you know, generally speaking, the first instinct is to think of inflation as this kind of inflation, the good kind. So output goes up, it 
goes hand in hand with inflation. It's called pro-cyclical. Inflation here is pro-cyclical. Y goes up, P goes up. So that's the downside. And please understand there are two other factors that will also drive this baby up, which are not policy instruments. C bar, which is consumer confidence, and I bar, which is investor confidence. So they, if they go up, this baby also goes up. And, but these are not policy instruments. I can't look at that, that lady there and say, hey, feel better. Your consumer confidence is higher. Your outlook is great. Go on your way home, buy a new car. I, I, that's not a button I can press. Okay, so it's endogenous, if you remember that word. It's from inside. So these two, very important. If we suddenly get euphoric, if we think, ah, we are finally out of COVID. Now all the extroverts amongst you, finally, I can go back on my carnival cruises, gyrate in confined spaces with thousands of people. My blood runs cold, by the way, but that's me. And so extroverts exploding out after COVID. Keep that in mind, but it's not a policy button. What happens now? So far, so good. So three policy buttons, those three guys. Then two more things here. Let's get to the pointer. These two guys, which are not policy buttons. Let's get back to blue, um, not to red. Now, what happens if this aggregate demand gets here? Let's now reach this point here. And that's an overheated economy. All the red lights go on, bubbles start falling. And this we were going to call P high. This is P high. And we're going to call this core. This is core inflation. Store this away. I'm giving you some new information here. So let's call this core inflation that much. And usually wage, wages are high here at this point. So the labor market's really tight. It's all this is sounding familiar to you, right? Labor market's tight, wages are rising high. And this is when Jay Powell, Greenspan, whichever era you guys are from, decides to do something about this baby and move this curve back down. And so that is a soft landing. Please understand that when this is when the Fed takes this curve back down and mm, mm, gently brings it back a soft landing. And how is this done? Quickly, it's done in an afternoon. It's done independently because remember, the person in the White House hates this. This is going to slow the economy. And as I've said in class, there was a Fed chairman called Martin, McChesney Martin, who said, this is like the guy who comes into a party just when the party is becoming interesting. So just when the first couple has disappeared into a closet, everyone's going, oh, okay, this party is going somewhere. The guy turns on the lights and takes away the punch bowl, takes away the alcohol. So soft landing, mm, very unpopular. The person in the White House goes, no, not now, after the election, not now. And so this is done, anyone? How was the soft landing done? Thank you, thank you. It's done by increasing, sorry. By increasing, thank you, increasing interest rates or decreasing the money supply. So, the and also Fed, in this case, reversing quantitative easing. Wow. Who, is, who, who said that? John Ravalli. John Ravalli. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> John, how is the son? John, how is the son? <laughs> he's doing well. He's, he's doing well. He's graduating. He's, graduating. he's, graduating. he's going to work he's this, going year. this year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And John, let's mute. Please. John, let's mute please. the phone or somebody's phone, phone or somebody's phones on. Okay, thank you, thank you. So John Ravalli brought his son in, and I gave him one of the Ember Four Color pens, and he was a tiny kid then, and now he's graduating. Okay, so raise interest rates, decrease M. 
Ooh, and please listen carefully now. This is called demand pull inflation. This is the only inflation the Fed can try and control. Okay, so this is the inflation. This is what Powell's been freaking out about, the wage inflation. And this is the 0 0.75, 0 0.75, 0 0.75. Next Wednesday, will it be just 0 0.25? We shall see. So, hmm, hmm trying to calm down an overheated economy, demand pull inflation. So this is what happened in January, February last year. C-bar and I-bar exploded. Euphoria, the darn COVID's over. Let's go out eating, let's travel. G was high like crazy. Oh man, was it high. I'm gonna take you into the deficits. M, we went insane. You, John mentioned quantitative easing, but base that's printing money. That's a fancy word for printing money, like we have lost our minds. When we printed 48 billion a month in COVID, that's when I lay awake at night. Then it was, sorry, in the, in the, in the subprime crisis, when we printed 48 billion, that's when I used to lie awake. In, the, in COVID, it was 120 billion a month. <laughs> At 1.160 1 billion a month. So huge M, interest rates zero, huge G last e, year, last C year. bar, I bar, I bar, e. out of control. And we were up there. And so the Fed started pushing interest rates up and doing a soft landing. The only complication is that was not the whole story. We had another problem superimposed on this. It was the perfect storm came out of nowhere. So store this diagram away. This is demand pull inflation. I'm writing this down. This is demand pull inflation. There was another inflation that was slapped right on top of that. And that is, let's come up in here, cost push inflation. So here we are, stay with me. Cost push inflation, and let's mute everything, everyone, please. So cost push inflation. Oh, sorry, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Cost push inflation is different. This is the bad kind. This is exogenous, which means comes from outside. COVID, oil shocks, 9-11, Katrina, Putin, invasion of Ukraine, which resulted in a food shock and an oil shock came out of nowhere. And bang, what does it do? Cost push inflation is the bad kind. Floods, monsoons are late in India, too much monsoon in India. Oh, and before I forget, for all the Indians out there, including myself, happy Republic Day. Today's an auspicious day. So happy Republic Day. Memories of my dad taking me to watch the parades in Mumbai. Um, Infantry only, no tanks there, sadly. So, happy Republic Day, everyone. All right. Cost push inflation, bang. This aggregate supply curve gets shoved to the left. COVID, supply chain shocks, semiconductor shocks, work distancing, shutdowns, China shutdowns, Ukraine. So, oil shutdown, food shutdown. And look at this. This is counter cyclical. So P has gone up and look at this, Y has gone down. So this is opposite here, P goes up and Y goes down. So this is counter cyclical. Look here, here, P went up. Let's get the pointer going. P went up from P0 to P1 and Y went up. So P goes up. Y goes up here, so this is pro-cyclical here, and here, okay, not cooperating. Okay, let's go up. Okay, I'm gonna erase the board. <laughs> it's too much data on the board, I think. Okay, so let's clear the board. Okay, so really quickly, counter cyclical. Yeah, 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 yeah. P zero, Y zero, 
and yeah, bang. So this is what happened on top of all our problems, P1, Y low. This is cost push inflation. And please listen carefully now. Pi is inflation and macro. So cost push inflation, it's exogenous. There is no cure for it. There's no point blaming Biden or anyone for this baby. And usually there is no macro response to it, okay? Um, the oil shock burns off. The Yom Kippur war ends. Um, COVID was the longest cost push shock. It took three years and it's still there. It's slowly burning off the semiconductor supply chains and all that. The floods recede um, or the rains finally come. The earthquake damage is fixed. So usually it's temporary. And this is the inflation that is the Fed result calls transitory inflation. So when the Fed was saying inflation is transitional or transitory, this is the component of inflation they had in mind, the cost push component. And remember, the Fed has no control over this. You know, going back to Old Testament, this was the inflation back when Pharaoh had the dream of seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, feast, famine. And Joseph said, you know, seven years of famine, seven, seven years of feast, so store food. So for cost push inflation, really, um, the only cures are petroleum reserve or food reserve, no Fed involved in here, you know. So our world has been this world here, you know, moving us right down to the present now. Here we are, nice large diagram, Keynesian aggregate supply curve. Here we were, so this is AD, let's say early 2022. And then we had the situation AD mid 2022. So C bar is up, I bar is up. So this is P0, Y0, this is P1, this is core inflation here. And then we had a supply side shock. So let's put in Putin, COVID, let's lump it all in there. Putin, of course, was the icing on the cake, the horrible shock. And so supply side shock, Ukrainian invasion. So this is cost push. So this is the combo, the one-two punch, as I've called it in the recent edition of my book. And this is known as headline inflation. So when you hear inflation in the news, that's this baby here. This is headline inflation. And that's about 6.5% this month. So that's a combo. So this is a, this is, has been our world. This is our world right now, everyone. It's a demand pull inflation and a cost push inflation combo. And it's 6.5%. This thing here, is um, something like 4.5%. And this gap here, which is food and fuel, which is what they say in the papers, food plus fuel, which is the exogenous cost push inflation is about 2%. So the 4.5 is really what the Fed is looking at because that's what the Fed can control. Remember the Fed can only control the demand pull part. And so inflation has gone from 9.5 in June last year to 6.5. This is not bad. And I said that it's going to come down quickly because the transitional stuff, this stuff here, cost push burns off and there's nothing we can do about it. And so much of the decrease in inflation has come from the cost push component. Now, here is the situation. So far, any questions about anything? So we've talked about headline inflation. Let me write this down here for you. Ah, board works. The headline inflation that you read or see in the papers is equal to the core inflation, which is demand pull. And that's the wage inflation. This is the Fed's target. This is the Fed's target. Plus food plus fuel, which is the cost push part. Yeah, Frank, go ahead. What's the question? 
Yeah, Professor, how are you? It's Frank hey, Frank. Hope everything's well. It's great to see you as usual. Uh, thank you again for the presentation and everything. Always invigorating. Uh, just basic question for you. Where are you getting that 4.5% number? Is that the core CPI? Is that PCE? Yes, you know? yes. Thank you. It's okay. core PCE. I'm just rounding it okay. off, Frank. So, so, P, so, so Frank is talking about the CPI, which is the core PCE. Uh, and that's really the target that the Fred Fed looks at. And on my blog page, if you want more, there's a session when I just talk about the core PCE, personal consumption expenditure. So it's a basket of goods pertaining to the core that the Fed tracks. So that's specifically what the Fed looks at. Frank, okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, yep. thank you. So here's where we are. And so, any other questions about this so far? Look at the chats real quick. Yeah, has anyone been to a gas? I know. I know. Go to Costco for gas, Chris. Chris, good, good seeing your name again. And I know, Jesse, I know. I bought a bunch of apples and they were over 10 bucks. And so, you know, I know. On one hand, I see the numbers and then I see what visually impacts us. And it seems so much more. And I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, the apparent inflation seems a lot more. Um, I, we look, but remember, we are looking at across the country. We're looking at all goods, a large market basket. Having said that, gas prices have gone down. Gas is 305, um, regular, unleaded. Um, so. All right, so this is a situation and here is the issue. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So that there that, are that three pressures here. Consumers, investors are seeing the inflation is falling. It is still painful. And remember, if you are under 50, and I read this, this is not original. If, you, if you're under 50 today, you think the sky is gonna fall on your head and you're gonna have a horrible recession and inflation is gonna wipe out your life. If you're over 50, apparently, according to this article, you are saying, calm down. This has happened before. We have seen this before. So calm down. You have never seen inflation. Welcome to the rest of the planet. This is how the rest of the world has been living. Calm down. So, that, so there are two groups of people looking at the future. But anyway, so here is the trifecta. Consumers are seeing inflation coming down. They're seeing a soft landing. Hmm. Now keep in mind, the economy is slowing. So I get reporters saying, you know, Professor, there's a recession coming. I'm going, well, look, a soft landing is painful. There is going to be a slowdown. Now, your question is, is it going to be a soft landing? Hmm. Like the lunar module softly landing on the moon from which this expression is derived? or boom, a hard landing, that's a recession. But a soft landing is painful. There will be job loss, that is the point. That is what the Fed is trying to do, slow it down. So when you call me up and ask for an interview and a quote about this recession, well, there is a soft landing that is part of the plan. You make an omelet, you have to break eggs, as my French students would tell me. So that's having said that, consumers are expecting that the soft landing is happening and that the Fed next week is only going to hit the brakes gently, 0.25%, which is huge, which means, whoa, we're getting out of this. Now, the problem with inflation is it's not an engineering thing. And being an engineer and in class, remember I, I talk about how macro is different from engineering. Well, in engineering and in science, you press a button, the light comes on. And then you press another button, the light goes off. In macro, you raise interest rates to slow things down. Nothing happens. Maybe for six months, maybe for a year. 
You lower interest rates to jumpstart the economy, nothing happens. Maybe for a year, three months, year and a half. That's the problem. That's one problem with macro are the lags, which we are less and less used to. You know, <laughs> right now everything is digital and instantaneous. Um, you go on a trip, you have your photographs, boom, 10,000 of them, which you never look at, by the way. And so here we are. So the lags, and once they tried to corner Milton Friedman, Rutgers' most famous graduate, I have to say that every time I mention his name, I know. And so they cornered Friedman and said, what do you mean by lags? And he famously said, long and variable lags, which still makes me laugh because that's the most Greenspan-like answer I have ever heard, vague, deliberately vague answer, you know? And so the lags is an issue. And the other issue with inflation is that it's not a ball rolling down a hill. Investors, once they expect inflation, wage contracts start going up. Unions start driving up two-year, three-year wage contracts. Oh yeah, inflation's coming. Oh my God, read this article in the journal? <laughs> it might be back to 9%. Let's push up a three-year wage contract. So long-term wage contracts go up. Futures contracts go up. So it's not just inflation today, it's expectations of inflation in the future. That's what the Fed has to break. The Fed has to break the chain between the expectations of inflation and inflation. You see? And so the Feds, so Jay Powell, so the consumers are optimistic. Oh my God, yeah, we're getting out of this. The Fed's thinking, if we let consumers think that this baby is over, we're going to stop hitting the brakes, C bar is going to go up. I bar is going to go up. Confidence is going to go up. They're going to go that they're going to push that curve to the right. And we are back to high inflation. So we better make horrible, threatening, scary sounds like we're gonna we're gonna stay till the fight's over, you know, Paul Volcker like stuff. No, we this fight's not over. We're gonna stick with it. And everyone goes, oh, oh my god, the market falls 500 points. So the Fed's thinking we can't let optimism run away. So the Fed's pushing back and the financial markets are stuck in the middle. So that's the trifecta happening right now. They're all playing this game of managing expectations right now. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the comments flashing up here. And you got, some of you just mentioned, I think in a chat, I just see them flashing. What about the job losses? Langdana, you seem so hopeful, but unemployment, jobs lost here and here and you know financial services and JP Morgan and here and Goldman Sachs and Amazon and so on. Look, keep in mind folks, unemployment lags business cycles. And I don't think this came up in class for whatever reason. So once an economy is gone down, it's just going down, recessions happening, you don't see job losses. Then the recession kind of bottoms out, you don't see job losses. Then the recession starts getting better and you start coming out. What has been happening over business cycles historically is employers hang on to their workers. Employers are trying their best to hang on to their workers for as long as possible because it doesn't pay to hire, to fire them and hire new workers. It, as you know, they wait, they hang on, they hang on. And finally, they just cannot do it. And so they let them go typically in the latter part of the recession. And so historically what we see is unemployment lags business cycles. So the economy is coming back up and that's when you see the job losses. Workers just can't hang on. Now, having said that, 98% of CFOs, there was a survey that just came out. It's in here somewhere. 98% of CEOs, nationwide have said they expect a mild recession that's going to burn off by mid-year. So they're not going to job losses. They're, they're rather push on productivity and um, cutting back discretionary spending and innovation. So they're hanging onto their workers. I am a little more sanguine than that. I don't even think a recession is coming. I think we're gonna have our soft landing and for a bunch of reasons, which I'm going to take you into soon, um, we're going to hopefully see growth in the spring.
So that's where I'm taking you. So that's the update. Um, that's the trifecta of the Fed's decision. I'm going to spend the next five minutes on the whole deficit story for you. But before that, any pressing questions about anything I've done that need addressing? I, I think that there's been a lot of behavior modification because this has been one of the most telegraphed recessions that we've ever had. And I think we've, we, we've had uh, people kind of change their behaviors around that. What do you think about that? What was the adjective, Johns? What recession? That, the most telegraphed recession. Oh, most telegraphed. Well, you know, first of all, this was the a recession unlike any other. Keep in mind the one before this, okay, housing. Another point I wanna make, housing also lags business cycles. So again, same story for housing. You know, typically when you're getting out and coming back out, that's when the housing losses begin. You know, because remember, you know, you're, you're starting your new home construction when things are good, you know? And so that carries on even when the economy has sunk. So housing typically, and unemployment lag business cycles, um, except the last recession where housing began that, that one in uh, 2008. The most telegraphed, you mean the most publicized, John? I mean, globally? I'm so yes, I, I just feel that we like, you know, we kind of gave way from talking about inflation and we went, went right to recession. And that's been kind of in, in, in the public's in the public domain at this point for a very long time. And I think people, and I think people have modified their behavior, which has slowed down the economy, which makes me want to agree with you that yes, there should probably will be a soft landing because we don't have to have a deep recession to solve this problem. Yes, the thing is first, you know, Many of us haven't seen a major recession or inflation. So this is all terrifying, especially for the United States. And secondly, and I'm going to end with this note, actually, Americans, just like the rest of the planet, were fed up. So in January, February last year, it was like, you know what? I don't want to wear a mask. I'm done. I need to get out and travel. You know, I'm spent three, wasted three years. And then boom, here comes Putin from nowhere. And that killed C-bar and I-bar. And the problem with consumer confidence and investor confidence is when it gets hammered, it takes forever to come back up. It takes forever to come back up. And we have in America have been on the back foot, you know, the rest of the world, one more time, one more time has written us off. And one more time, we're gonna to have to prove them wrong by coming up with the next big thing. And as you know, I'm big on that. And I think we're going to get there, but that has to factor in too. Okay, let's get into the deficit situation. Um, so no one talked about deficits, deficit and debt and Jesse for you, the debt ceiling, which is when, when is the whole drama being played out? It's being played out now, right? the debt ceiling drama? Just say yes so I can go on someone. Yes. yes, okay. yes. Thank you, thank you. So here we are. Let's get back into my diagram. Deficits, I'm gonna clear this. Okay, so deficits and debt. And we just did this last night in class. I'm sure you all know this, but indulge me everyone while I just kind of quickly go over and actually, well, let's do it. Deficit is G minus T, let's prefer blue. G minus T greater than zero is a budget deficit. This is a federal budget deficit. And G is government spending when government spending is larger than tax revenues, then that's your federal budget deficit, okay? And this was a huge deal. Every election, this was a main source of discussion. And by the way, um, before I forget, if you need more on anything I've said, and if you have time, you know, you're trapped at an airport for five hours or Narita for five hours, which I'm always at for some reason, go to Langdana blog page. 
Just go to Google, type in Langdana blog page. It'll take you to my web page. Scroll down. There's everything in macro that you could possibly want. A video, uh, articles, everything. Okay, so budget deficit. This is an annual number, everybody. It's one year, an annual number. Government spending minus taxes. Debt, not to be confused. Debt is a cumulative number. So firewall here. So debt is all the borrowing Uncle Sam has done from today, yesterday, day before, going back to minus infinity. So it's all the all the money Uncle Sam owes. That's debt. It's a cumulative number. Okay. And so the debt GDP ratio today is debt divided by GDP. Please note it's always a ratio is approximately 123%. The deficit GDP, remember the deficit GDP ratio, Y is GDP, GDP today is approximately 5.5%. So two different numbers, there's lots of confusion. Debt is cumulative, deficit GDP ratio is 5.5. Now, what's this deal with sustainability? So I'm gonna back up here. This baby here, let's talk about this first. When the deficit GDP ratio, generally before 2008, when this was under 5%, this was thought to be sustainable. And can anybody tell me in plain English what that was supposed to mean? This is deficit GDP ratio in plain English. We yeah, did we it. Throw our way out of it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have enough cash flow to to pay the debt and meet our obligations in a in, in a formal manner while we can still bring down the you know the debt gradually. Safe yeah. haven. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Ronnie. How are you? Good seeing you. So like, let's combine both the answers. Thank you. So sustainable means under five percent. Remember, the deficit is financed by borrowing. All right. So people lend to Uncle Sam, and these are new treasuries that are sold in auctions, simply put. And the biggest lender is still China. Still China, huge, number one, distant second, Japan, and then everybody else. Never Germany, the Germans don't lend to us anymore, not since George W. Bush's time. So China is the biggest lender. So deficit is bond financed, it's financed by borrowing and sustainable simply means one year I borrow from that gentleman there who represents a Japanese insurance company. I'm Uncle Sam. Next for one year, I borrow from him. I pay him back next year by borrowing from that lady who represents a large Chinese state-owned enterprise. Pay her, Uncle Sam pays her back next year. Next year, somebody from Brazil. Next year, somebody from and the, the Midwest uh, custom conglomerate here. Keep rolling it over. So under 5% sustainable deficit means you can roll that baby over till the end of time. That's sustainability. Over 5%, needless to say, back in the day was non-sustainable. And this story is again back, please note, I'm going to tell you why this whole story disappeared in plain English. So what is non-sustainable now in plain English? Somebody. What happens when a deficit is non-sustainable in plain English? It can't be bond financed anymore. Hey, Carrie. <laughs> so yes, exactly. Thank you. So non-sustainable means over 5%. The rest of the world goes, hey, what are you doing in America? No, no. Sorry, we're not coming to your bond auction. No, no more bonds. Um, we, how will you pay us back? Yeah. And so over 5% means it's dangerous. Your deficit is too big. Foreigners aren't going to lend to you. We don't have enough savings at home. So you're going to have to print money. You're going to have to monetize, which is a bad word in macro. 
monetization, which is basically a crude word for printing money. And typically over 5%, 6, 7, 8, 10, 20, 30%, no one's lending, you, you're stuck. You gotta pay your teachers, your soldiers, your postal workers, your doctors. You, you crank out the presses, you print money, you get the German hyperinflation, or you, here we are, German hyperinflation, 10 million marks, backside blank, 1918, and here, $100 trillion. Hoping you can see this. $100 trillion, Zimbabwe, at one point worth 75 cents. Today, maybe $16, hyperinflation. Your worst possible nightmare. <laughs> Everything you worked for, boom, going to zero in maybe a few days time. So absolute no-no, terrifying. You guys tell me, the subprime crisis, we were 12% into monet let me write down monetization and hyperinflation. Too much money is being printed. There are not enough goods. Prices skyrocket. It's like 10 multiplied by, it's like one times 10 raised to 24 zeros. Everybody, let's mute, please. Thank you. Thank you. So hyperinflation, it's your end. It's the end. You know, you really, it's, it traumatizes you forever. And I know some of you have been in hyperinflation economies. Let's just please, uh, Nancy, if you could uh, poke around and try and mute, please. Thank you. So 12% in the subprime crisis, 2010. I'm actually in Shanghai when I get a call from somebody at the European Central Bank saying, hey, Fro, you know, your number is coming out of the Fed and the Treasury. Um, it's going to be 12%. And the sky didn't fall on her head. Prior to that, Reagan years, it was 6.3%. Sky didn't fall on ahead. Then in subprime, it was anything from 14 to 17%. Uh, sorry, in COVID, the deficit GDP ratio. People thought, oh, the sky is going to fall on our heads. Hyperinflation. This nightmare in America. Oh, my God. No more safe haven. What happened? Can anyone tell me? We printed money like nobody's business. If somebody mentioned, um, John mentioned QE. We were banging out. We were bailing out all the bad boys and girls who had the rotten mortgages in COVID. You heard my story. 48 billion. It still makes my blood boil. Bailed them out. They laughed all the way to the bank. We own the rotten mortgages still by the way. Then in COVID, oh yeah. Oh man, bang it out. This reporter called me up a couple of weeks ago and said, you know, professor, so all the money, I said, yeah, right now there is 1.7, sorry, 1.6 trillion excess savings right now from COVID checks. And I saw some of the chats. That's why a large percentage of our labor force is sitting at home. People aren't working. That money is going to burn off by March and they're going to come back into the workforce. So around 1.6 trillion excess dollars in, say, in, in excess savings. Um, and so the reporter said, Professor, yeah, everybody got checks. Everybody I know got checks. You know, my parents got checks, grandparents, their friends got checks. I said, no, I didn't get a check. For God's sake, I, I'm... How everyone didn't get checks. So anyway, tell me here what happened. We banged out the money, banged out spending, 14 to 17 percent. It was four point, it was six point three in the Reagan years, and they freaked out and they brought G down, Graham Rudman's Hollands. What happened? How come the sky didn't fall on our heads? Liquidity yeah. trap. Liquidity trap. Wow. You guys must have had an amazing macro professor. <laughs> <laughs> so liquidity trap in plain English. And this People was- People weren't spending the money, right? Yes. They were hiding it away. Yeah, the CBAR, what happens is 
the money you print becomes this and hyperinflation and 10 to the power of 28 zeros only when that money is spent. And in the previous inflations, the Weimar Republic, um, Zimbabwe, Venezuela today, Sri Lanka is heading that way, by the way. What happened is that the money is printed, you're paying the postal workers who haven't been paid in six months. So they take the money and they pay the bills. You're paying the army, the home guards, the nurses who haven't been paid in three months, six weeks, five months. So they finally get the money, they're paying the mortgage people, they're paying the rent, they're paying for groceries. So it's boom, immediately in circulation. That's when the sky falls on your head. And we've talked about this in previous events. What didn't happen was here, C bar and I bar was so low, confidence was so low. You're printing the money, nobody's borrowing. You have COVID, nobody is spending. People are hunkering down. You got all these checks coming. You can't travel, you can't eat, you can't go out. It sits there. And my analogy is a good one. It's like a cobra bite. When a poisonous snake bites you, enough doctors and enough nurses, Faith, I saw you in there. When a poisonous snake bites you, you die only if the venom goes into your bloodstream. If, if it bites you on the thigh or the arm and doesn't hit an artery, just a bruise, you don't die. And obviously we're not going to experiment with that, right? And so same thing with money. If it doesn't go into the bloodstream, no hyperinflation. It just sat there, hmm. liquidity trap. The liquidity was trapped. Nobody was borrowing, nobody was lending. There was no hyperinflation. And suddenly the whole deficit story, boom, was gone. Stephanie Kendron, a professor at University of Maryland, writes this book. To my credit, I said, oh my gosh, this is just, it's, I feel like I'm in a macro twilight zone. To my credit, and it's there in my blogs. You can go back. She's deficits don't matter. It's a deficit, it's called fiscal deficit myths. And I'm going, deficits do matter, Stephanie. This is a this is a, a particular condition, a liquidity trap. So we, you had this weird weather event, you know, where you're seeing three suns, whatever that's called. It's a freaky thing. There's nothing's broken. It's a special weird event. And here comes Bernie Saunders. Oh look, deficits don't matter. We can spend. You want this free? Take it. You want two trillion? Take three trillion. And Alessandra Ocasio-Cortez on that same vein. And even Biden got carried away with that first budget. I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, how are we gonna pay for this? You know, so there, that was called modern monetary theory. And we've talked about this. It wasn't modern, it wasn't a theory, it was nonsense. But confidence came up, the money was being spent. Boom, all this vanished. So deficits do matter. So. Let me take you back now. Sustainable, this 5% sustainability, what this means is that under 5%, the debt divided by GDP should be going down over time. Now listen carefully, folks, this is new. First of all, look at this. It's, use my marker here. It's deficit divided by GDP, debt, divided by, so it's the ratio of debt and deficit relative to GDP. I just don't understand when you have, oh, the national debt is 30, 31 trillion. Oh my God, I'm going, okay, how much is the GDP? Because, you know, talking about just the numerator by itself makes no sense. It's like my looking at that gentleman sitting there and saying, you're 220 pounds? That's a lot. Wait a minute. What if this the gentleman there is six foot six foot six and not an ounce of fat on him? So how big is he? Uh, how tall is he? Oh. Your house has eight bedrooms? Whoa. What if that lady there has got 10 kids? And it's a nice large Italian joint family. 
and grandparents on both sides and cousins twice removed and 25 people in there, many animals, but then it's a different story. So, so another takeaway, next time you hear, see these numerators by themselves, you need to burst out laughing. It's the ratio, it's the ratio. Okay, so let's see what's happening. So, the, okay, let's come up. Okay, so much for that. You know, I'm thinking my board freezing is correlated with me using the pointer. Something about the pointer is freezing my mobility. All right. And banner goes to another board. Okay, so under 5%, let's use black. I'll give you some new intuition here. So deficit GDP ratio, historically under 5% meant that the debt under that 5%, the string of debt GDP ratios would be falling. GDP decreasing, and let me explain that. So this is the Dornbush model. And those of you who have my book, um, the chapter three, Rudy Dornbush, this is not widely printed. This was an addendum to another book that Rudy Dornbush wrote. I loved it when I was in grad school and I captured it and I met Rudy Dornbush and I said, that's the best definition of sustainability I have read. This is when I was an assistant professor and Rudy said, well, where are you? And I said, Rutgers. Oh, they'll make you work very hard. Tell them not to make you work very hard. And I said, okay, Rudy, I'll tell them not to make very work very hard. Clearly, I failed in that. So here we are, Rudy Dornbush, brilliant man. I think, God bless him, he just passed away. So here is what was supposed to happen. Under 5%, sustainability meant the debt GDP ratio would go from, say, 89% of GDP to, um, so let's say in um, 2018 to 79, 70, uh, 83% in 2020 to say 79% in 2020, 2023. So that's what I'm talking about. Over time, a sustainable meant that ratio falls and that is sustainability in macroeconomics. And usually, and last night somebody asked me a great question, why 5%? It's an empirical, there is no deep hidden theoretical meaning in the five. It's, it's a cause, it's, it's correlated. At around 5%, under 5%, we see the debt GDP ratio falling over time. Over 5%, that debt GDP ratio goes from say 70 to 73 to 81 to 121. That's non-sustainable if it's growing over time because you know that if something's not going to last forever, it will not last forever, right? As somebody famously said. So that is non-sustainable. And this is sustainable and generally under 5 point, under 5%. So we are 5.5%. And in terms of our debt GDP numbers, guys, it's not, I'm not lying awake at night. Debt GDP numbers, our highest was 132% ever. And this was um, in 2021. And then since then, it's 129% and now 123%. So falling. Deficit was under 5% because the large government spending of COVID was gone, but interest rates started going up. And so interest payments went up 37%, I think. So we went back over 5%. So I'm not freaking out. Remember it's ratio of GDP and so, my response from now on till the end of time, guys, when you're in the corner office with the macro backdrop and you are making macro strategy, when this debt ceiling comes up again, this legal upper limit, your response should be, that's your response. It's a non-event. 
they always extend it. Right now, especially, the debt GDP ratio is falling. It's a political thing. Everybody gets all scared. Oh my gosh, they make deals with each other. And at the end of the day, they extend it. Um, it's a red herring. It's the biggest red herring of all time. And anybody not on this Zoom call today often freaks at all. <laughs> oh, thank God, the, the, the breath ceiling drama is over. It's always going to be over. There's never an issue. Yawn. Don't worry about it. So that's the debt deficit story. Okay, guys, any pressing questions? The 38 chats, let me glance at them. Yes, Frank, so that's the debt service. So when you said debt GDP ratio going up, part of that is the interest payments. 5% is for mature economies. Emerging economies for India, China, Argentina, Brazil, that ratio is probably higher, more like 7 or 8%. So we had 5.5. We were at 16 or 17 in COVID. And, you know, frankly, thank God we had this liquidity trap thing or we would have had an issue. So we could print money and we didn't have hyperinflation and we managed to pay everybody. And we could do more of that in America than the rest of the world could. So, so in other words, it was almost like a weird macro miracle that this liquidity trap thing happened, which allowed us to, at one point, print 160 billion a month. It's like a macro Twilight Zone story. Okay, how are you folks? Four people raised hands. So let's go with Joe. Joe? Yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Mangana. This is marvelous as usual. The entertainment is as good as the, uh, economy, the economics. So what is your confidence level in, in the soft landing and why soft here and not Asia and Europe? Well, Asia, you're talking of China now? China is a whole different ball game. Okay, so, so how about China then? Uh, we'll have to do another session on China, and that's a heartbreaker. <laughs> you know, China got lucky, and I have so many Chinese students here, including my dean. China had some superstar macro people, and you all know Zhu Rongji is my hero. Jiang Zemin, Dai Xionglong, Zhu Xiaochuan, they really knew macro. Um, this guy, Xi Jinping, doesn't understand macro, wants to autarky, wants to make everything in China, shut down his most effective companies. Because remember, the more China developed, the more free market it got, the less power the central government has. That's yeah. what capitalism is about, right? And so yeah. they couldn't handle that. So tore up some of the best companies. And China is playing off the back foot now. So, so how, how about your confidence in the soft landing? Because that's actually more important. For them to remember, China, the big complication with China. No, for, you, for us, US. For, yeah, but China has a SAP bubble in housing that's finally going. So that's a huge, huge issue. Um, China's biggest metric was housing prices, but China's savings was in their houses, and that's going. For us, I'm going to come back to us. I'm going to end it with that. Thank you. Real quick, um, Cliff, and uh, I don't, yes. Okay, Cliff, so the gentleman next to Cliff and Ronnie, really quick, guys. All right. Uh, you indicated that you don't think we're going to be entering into a recession, is what I understood. But the inver uh, inverted yield curve ah. uh, you taught us was, you know, predicting recession. So how do yes. you reconcile that? See, this is two, why, Cliff, you know what? Sorry to interrupt you. This is why the Druids never wrote anything down because they didn't have people like you saying, but it's in your book. <laughs> no, this, remember, Cliff, a soft landing is an inverted yield curve too. So a, a yield curve inversion, soft landing is in there. Why falling, activity slowing down, inflation coming down, that's consistent with an inverted yield curve. So an inverted yield curve says a slowing economy is coming, not necessarily a crashing economy. So we are okay there. Okay. And second, uh, doesn't inflation help pay off the debt? Yes, that's the concern. So inflation is, helps the government. They're paying back in pieces of green paper that 
can buy less. And that's the big worry, you know? So we need to stop that. Uncle Sam really got a good deal in the 70s. Gentlemen, is that Ashraf? I can't see you. Go ahead real quick and then Ronnie real quick. Hands up, Gentle, gentlemen with the hand up, yes. No. Okay, so for, Ronnie, yeah. So good question. Um, a lot of the government packages that they passed, starting with, with Trump administration, um, these were multi-year disbursements that have not been fully dispersed because a lot of these things that when, when the packages were passed, Congress approved them, they were like two, three, four, five years. So a lot of these things are already approved and they're going to be disbursements every year, as you know, plus the new packages that keep getting passed on, like the infrastructure package, all of that liquidity coming in. And I know we're reversing quantitative easing, but how, how is that offset working off? Because as we keep making these disbursements, there's more monetary supply coming in. Yeah. So real quick, yeah, real quick for you, and then we look at the Biden thing. Real quick for mm -hmm. what Ronnie is saying is that no matter how hard the Fed reduces liquidity, the reality is that liquidity is pouring in. Forget the disbursements, Ronnie. Hot capital is pouring into this country from China, Hong Kong, Russia, and Ukraine. India is getting a lot of hot capital right now from China too, by the way. You know, so, but here, Singapore, hot capital is pouring in. So the reality is that when you look at the actual money, more and more is coming in. But the signal we are sending to the interest rate, to the financial markets is we are slowing things down. It's the, it's the big interface that really doesn't mesh. When you, when you, and this is why we don't measure M1, M2, M3 anymore like we used to, because we've essentially lost control of our money supply. That capital is pouring into our country. I have embers, some of you are here from China, who are buying properties and seen here in Baltimore and Toronto and in New Jersey, sitting there and on the laptops buying, pro moving the money over. Okay, let's look at the Biden stimulus plan and how this man might luck out. And he does need a little luck. I just want to know, who are these people prowling around his house looking for documents is what I want to know. Isn't that his own staff? Who are these people? That's, you don't have to answer. Okay, so here we are, um, the labor market. So if Biden, let's see the first thing. Number one, there is a conventional Keynesian stimulus plan coming. It's the Keynesian stimulus, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. Inflation Reduction Act has nothing to do with inflation, by the way. It's a textbook Keynesian stimulus, increasing in G. He's a high priest Keynesian. Now, some taxes are gonna go up. If you're making more than 1 billion a year book value, 15% flat tax rate for them. And again, that's book value. I'm not sure, so sure what that means. Um, but Keynesian stimulus is coming. But the Fed, wages, what's the Fed going to do? And here is something that will help. What happened in COVID? Here is labor demand. And here is labor supply. What happened in COVID is the participation rate, this is wages, this is real wages. In COVID, the labor supply shrank. And even today, and I saw some of the chats, this is the participation rate, this is here's wages high. So one reason wages are high and some great chats, I just glanced at them, is not that the labor market's overheated, you know, it, yeah, yeah, overheated in a sense, but the real issue for high wages, which has been, which the Fed fixates on, is the participation rate. People are not participating in working. The size of the labor force is tiny. So the participation rate is how many people from the, what percentage of the population is in the civilian labor force. And so people have pulled out um, 20 to 24 year olds down by like almost 2.5%. They graduated, COVID happened, they never went out. They're still at home with their parents. Then the 45 to 65 year olds, 
they're getting, and all these people have got these COVID checks and 1.7, 1.6 trillion excess savings still out there now. Some of it was spent in the holidays, I'm sure. So the 45 year olds are like, you know, I'm not talking all of them. I'm talking of 2.5%, but that's a large number. I got COVID checks, social security payment coming not that far away. Maybe I can just coast through, maybe. So they are sitting out. So the participation rate is as low as 1977s. It is that low. It's still, it went down. When I spoke to Dean Lay's board, it had gone down. So these people are sitting out. And what's going to happen by March or April? At least there's a sense this is what's going to happen. They're going to burn through their money. They invested some of the stimulus checks in SPACs and cryptocurrency and AOL or whatnot. They're going to come back in. And you can see by March or April, this might be a freebie for Biden. The wage pressure might come down. Participation rate might go up. And so there is a sense that this is going to break. And these people may have been consumer facing, may have to schlep into work, like as many of you are already. Um, so participation rate, most likely going up. The other one, stimulus plan coming up. The third thing in Biden's thing is electric vehicles. He's giving you a 7,500 buck rebate if your electric vehicle is manufactured in America, assembled in America, if the components for the electric vehicle, read battery, are from US or US free, free traders. So US, Mexico, Canada, South Korea, Japan. Europe is not included. So the components come from there. So it has to be assembled in America. You get 3750 rebate, manufacturers do. Components come from friendly free trade countries. And then most controversial, if the supply chain should avoid countries that may not be safe, there is a euphemism. Um, I can't find it. Some sort of weird euphemism, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. And so that's part, so the Biden administration really wants EVs and lithium batteries to be built here. And trying to use Adam Smith, giving the incentive for stuff to move here, but it's going to take time. So Kia is pushing back, you know, Kia has built a factory in Ohio, but it'll take 2024 to come online. Honda is, come, is here, um, Honda's in Ohio, Kia is somewhere else, Kansas or something, I forget. So they're saying, give us some time. We are moving, we are make, making EV, EVs in America, but this is too soon. But the focus is on lithium batteries. And what happened folks is that while we were obsessing with Trump and averting insurrections and ignoring Marjorie, whatever her name is, going through all that drama, China was grabbing the lithium supply chain. And so let me just give you some examples here. China controls 35% of the world's nickel, 50% of the world's processing. Okay, I'm talking processing here. 50% of lithium, 60% of cobalt, and 90% of rare earth metals. One more statistic. In terms of the the, the anodes, so the positive terminal of the batteries, which account for two thirds of production, six largest manufacturers are Chinese. And cathodes, that's the negative terminal, two out of the top three are Chinese. So we have lost the lithium thing. We are focusing on yesterday's battle, you know? <laughs> You know, we're trying to close the cage. What's the expression? Lock the door after the... It's yesterday's battle. The, 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 the Bidenites might be better doing a Clinton, uh, Reagan sort of thing or an Ireland sort of thing and saying five years, no taxes. You come up with the next battery. Maybe it's magnesium. Magnesium has twice 
the energy density as lithium. Um, it's it's cheaper to process. It's not nearly as environmentally degrading as lithium. Maybe Rook? it's aluminum, yes. I'm so sorry, there's not a good pause for me to interrupt, so I apologize. There's about five minutes left. I know you taught yes. late last night. You had EMBA interviews today. Yes, You've been yes. driving um, all around. Thank so you. I really want to be conscientious of thank your you. time. Yeah. I'm going to wrap this up and then I'm going to show you the last five minutes. Maybe go over by five minutes. Okay, folks? So, so I'm thinking lithium is a battle that's lost. There's aluminum, there's manganese, oh, sorry, magnesium. So perhaps tax breaks, five years tax breaks, come up. Let the private sector fund the new battery. Let's not force the private sector. Let's not force the smart minds to focus on lithium. China's grabbed lithium. Let's go post lithium. But what I'm saying here, folks, is I see the participation rate going back up. It's inevitable that money is going to burn off. They'll come back to work. I see a stimulus plan, a Keynesian stimulus plan, and it's actually a good stimulus plan. There's lots of good G in it. I see hopefully a post lithium battery, but above all, I remember what happened is in America. See, this is a restless country. You know, we lost automobiles to South Korea, Japan. We invented SUVs. We lost semiconductors to Taiwan. We invented microprocessors. We lost computers, you know. Um, so we came up with the, uh, the internet. So just when we lose out, we come up with the next big thing. And I'm sure other countries have examples too. So I'm hopeful. I've reached a point where I think Americans are fed up. And I think we've reached a point where innovation may be about to explode because it's, this is a restless country. So when you put all this together, I see growth in the spring. And I'm going to show you now a video for five minutes, please indulge me here. It's from one of my top 10 movies of all time. It's called Being There. Some of you have seen this before. Um, this is when um, it's, um, who's the actor? I'm drawing a blank, but it's one of my favorite movies. Peter Sellers, so the main guy, Peter Sellers, he's mentally challenged, real quick. He's a gardener. He's actually a gardener. And he's been kept in a garden by some guy who dies. So now he's pushed out on the streets in Washington and he's mentally challenged. So he's wandering around and he bumps into this limousine driven by this lady who is a tyke, who's the wife of a tycoon. So he bumps his knee. So she says, okay, oh my gosh, you come to our big mansion and we'll take care of you. So now he's in the mansion. And this lady's husband is a mentor to the president of the United States. Who visits the mansion to ask his mentor about the economy and the economic outlook? And the, his mentor introduces the president to Mr. Gardner, he thinks that's his name, but he's really a gardener and he's really mentally challenged. God bless him. And so they're talking about macro forecasts. And I want you to watch five minutes. So here you are. And then we'll take some questions and answers. And being there, here you go. And these are the best in the business, these actors. So watch carefully. So, so there you have it. It's not just me. Um, there'll be growth in the spring. I've visited that place. It's the Beltmore Estate in North or South Carolina. It's a Rockefeller house, by the way. And you can actually go to the library. So there you go. Um, growth in the spring. And uh, have I been wrong? Yeah, once before with the Ukrainian bonds when I read them wrong, so who knows, but I'm seeing growth in the spring. Um, I'm not seeing a horrible recession and, um, and I'm seeing a post lithium battery coming from here. And till we meet again, I hope that your C bar and I bar always stays high. So thank you very much, so much for being on. And it's so good to see all of you. And I wish we could spend more time and just catch up. So thank you. Come to some of the in-person open houses. 
thank you again, um, Sharon and team, and Dean Lay, if you're still here, thank you for being here.